Freeman, is that you? Yes, it is. You are a legend. I'm privileged to speak to you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this is thrilling. I've, I've watched a lot of your uh, your videos. You are just on the cutting forefront of waking up society. Oh, man. Uh, it, thank you. It's, it's an honor. <laughs> Beaming out across the galaxy, this is where conspiracy on the wild side meets the perspective of a lifetime. This is the Free Zone with your host, Freeman. Hello and welcome to the Free Zone. Well guys, just a quick update on the great YouTube purge. Yes, channels on YouTube are going down left and right. It seems if you mention crisis actors, false flags, or Pizzagate, your channel will be deleted from YouTube. Many have gone down, Infowars, Richie Allen, Richie from Boston, many others, uh, gone, already gone, and rebuilding their YouTube channels. Uh, Freeman TV YouTube channel? One more strike, guys. I have two strikes. Now, these come retroactively. These are shows that are years old that suddenly they put into action these new community guidelines, and boom. Freeman TV YouTube channel has two strikes, and it's waiting on its third. Now, to be honest with you, I went and I deleted any video that I thought would get a strike from the community guidelines. I mean, for me, YouTube is not my place. Right? I have a hundred and some thousand of you there listening on YouTube, but freemantv.com is the place to get everything uncensored and free or you know, straight to you without any hassle. So freemantv.com is the place you want to go. What you need to realize at this moment is that Big Brother is putting the responsibility of keeping inde independent media going into your hands. You see, it's sponsors that are causing all of these problems. Sponsors are what keep me from getting on the bigger shows. Sponsors are what have demoted my videos. And now community guidelines from sponsors is the reason they are deleting channels. And Freeman TV YouTube channel is so close. One more strike. And I don't know what one will bring it and which one won't. So this puts sponsorship of independent, independent, I can't see to get that word out today. This puts sponsorship of independent media into your hands. Uh, it's now you guys or no one because it's going to go and we won't make anything from YouTube. We won't make everything. You know, I'm blocked from Facebook. I'm blocked from everywhere. So I hope that you will follow me on Twitter uh, at Freeman TV to get all the news stories and thoughts and theories and everything. I tweet daily and I tweet for you uh, because this is my last bastion of, of social media is Twitter. And I hope you all will actually come to FreemanTV.com and listen to the programs and look around to see all the data that's there. Uh, because, yeah, I could be off YouTube tomorrow. I don't know. But tonight... Tonight, folks, we are taking a fascinating voyage through the psychotic mind and into the presence of another world which constantly surrounds and affects us. Tonight, we are talking with Jerry Marzinski. He's a clinical psychiatrist that has worked in prisons and asylums for 35 years. He's gotten deep into understanding what the voices are telling schizophrenics. But just like many of us, he was unable to tell any of his family, friends, or peers what he was learning from these psychotic voices. So please welcome to the Free Zone, the amazing Jerry Marzinski. Welcome, Jerry. Well, <clears throat> glad, I'm very glad to be here and, and speak with you. I want, I want to make one correction. I'm not a clinical psychiatrist. I'm a uh, licensed psychotherapist. Um, that I is do the have, difference, yes. Yeah. I, I've got 35 years of experience working on the front lines of mental health, including seven in a, the largest state hospital in the world uh, with the criminally insane. Uh, you know, I've got ten, uh, about 16 years working in, in the prison, uh, 10 years working crisis in hospital ERs and various mental health centers. Uh, that you have a resume that I couldn't read. 
I mean, the list of universities, the PhDs, the, the hospitals, the prisons, the asylums, you have been deep into this situation. Now, oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's, a, it's a totally different world that most people don't you know, even suspect uh, exists. Um, I want to share know. a story with you, Jerry. I went on a trip on my school bus in 2012, and for some reason when we were in the Northeast, everyone around here wanted to take me to a haunted something or another. It seems there are so many ghosts here in the Northeast from the Civil War and the Revolutionary War that uh, this is the most haunted place around here. And one of these places was a haunted asylum. And as we were wandering through, the host that was showing us around started talking about Abraham Lincoln's father-in-law, Robert Smith Todd. Now, Robert Smith Todd, Abraham Lincoln's father-in-law, was a financier, a banker. He was known for these things. But for some reason, and I could not find any evidence of this on the internet when I was doing kind of a cursory inspection to find more, uh, I couldn't find any story on Robert Smith Todd service in psychiatry or psychology or any of it and yet here was this story of Abraham Lincoln's father-in-law in this creepy asylum now you sent me some pictures of the places you've worked and I mean these places are they're just creepy and I'm going to include your pictures and if I can find them the pictures of this asylum in the post but they told us that he took great pleasure Mr. Todd in using torturous binding techniques that would chain their neck to their arms to back to their feet to the point where they had to roll these patients around the asylum on these contortion devices and then out back they had a big spring-loaded noose that would just launch the person up in the air breaking their neck and this was the place that they came to help people. This is, you know, I mean, just just go ahead right there, Jerry. I mean, you know, this is what doctors are doing to try and help these people. This is insane. Well, uh, I checked into the, you know, history of Central State Hospital, which, uh, you know, at the time I was there, probably had 8,000 patients, but in the 50s, it was up to uh, 13,000. It sprawls over 2,000 acres and, and was taking people in well before the Civil War. And, uh, you know, it's back in the early days, I mean, psychiatry didn't know what this stuff was all about. A lot of these guys, the most violent, were chained to the walls or chained to wagons. Um, and, uh, you know, when they were brought to the hospital, uh, you know, it, they found that if they were treated with kindness, that they weren't anywhere near as violent. So the early days of the hospital, uh, the director, Dr. Powell, would resist chaining these guys up as much as possible. And I think uh, Carl Jung found the same thing out, that if they're treated with kindness, they, they get better. Uh, but they didn't have any drugs back then. So, you know, a lot the violent ones, they, they chained up. Uh, and then they started with insulin shock. Uh, you know, they had they had this population which was growing, growing, growing. And before the days of um, you know large scale uh, tranquilizers, antipsychotics, uh, they were using stuff like insulin shock or hot and cold water, dipping them in hot and cold water. They didn't know what caused these things, why they were this way. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, straitjackets. I used to own a couple of those. I mean, they'd wrestle these guys into straitjackets and they would hold them there until they were totally exhausted. There were these huge battles between the attendants and, uh, and the patients. Uh, and both sides got hurt. Now, bones were broken, noses were broken on both sides. Um, yeah, and then they, the uh, when they started with the shock treatments, oh man, um, you know there were at Central State there were three thousand shock treatments being given a year, and that's uh, they would basically stun the brains of these guys, and those shock treatments were, 
you know, more often used as punishments for misbehavior than anything else. Right. And, you know, after running this uh, electricity through their brains, they they were like stunned for a long period of time. Uh, right, right after I got there, I got a call from one of my uh, cohorts who he was having a um, shock treatment demonstration at his psychiatric unit. And I'd never seen one before. And he goes, you want to come? So, you know, I shot over there. I'm like, wow, shock treatment. I, I get to see one of these things because they were just legend before that. So I'm standing there and here's this uh, Cuban psychiatrist with a bunch of uh, students around him, you know, lecturing. Uh, and then they brought in this very frail old lady who was, you know, very depressed. Um, and she was apparently trained. I mean, she'd get on this gurney and... Uh, Here's a shock machine there, you know, a wooden box, and here's the, the doctor holding up these two electrodes were about two inches by two inches. Uh, and he's going, this is what, you know, we use to administer electricity through their brain. Uh, and he said it, it's good for you know, temporary treatment of psychosis and, and intractable depressions, and, you know, he's lecturing on and on. Uh, so here's these two nurses bring this little frail old lady in and they, they strap her down. They four point her very tight and uh, the doctor is putting on these electrodes on each side of her head. They, he puts gel underneath the electrodes and then kind of straps those on. Uh, so I'm you know, watching all this and then he gets this, the biggest horse needle I've ever seen and it's full of this white fluid and he, he <laughs> keeps jabbing her with it trying to find the vein. I mean, and this thing must have held two or three ounces of this white milky fluid. And uh, then he starts uh, not not just injecting her with it, but he starts sucking blood into that tube and then pushing it back, sucking it back, and then he slowly pushes it in. And I said, "Well, well what's that for?" You know, and he goes, "Well, that's a that's a major tranquilizer. I mean, if we didn't give her the tranquilizer, once she got hit by the shock, you know, when she convulses." It, she'd break her bones and I'm like what <laughs> she can break her bones due to the shock you know I'm like standing there watching this like holy sh you know and they, he, he pushes this whole big thing of fluid into her vein and uh, then he tells everybody to step back and he flips the switch on this box and uh, boom and, and she just starts convulsing and just you know writhing and and, and straining against those those restraints and and you know i'm looking at this like horrified i mean here's this poor little old lady and she's just convulsing there and and the, while this guy's lecturing on and on you know it's like oh this is a convul you know like like it's nothing and i'm like shocked i'm, I'm like horrified and uh i'm like well when's he going to turn that damn thing off you know and then finally he sw he switches it off and he continues lecturing to the students, and like nothing. And I'm looking at her, and she's turning purple. She's turning cyanotic. And I'm like horrified. And I go, hey, hey man, she's, she's dying. She's turning cyanotic. And, you know, almost as an afterthought, he looks down, and she's purple. And he goes, oh, oh. So he gets the paddles, you know, the heart paddles, and he shocks her again. Mm -hmm. And uh, she, yeah, she comes to life, and I'm like, holy cow. You know, I like... And I'm looking around at all the other people, and they're just like looking like, oh, well, so that's how it's done. And I'm like reeling, you know. And I go to walk out, and, and I started to faint. I mean, I, I, I hung on to this pillar, and, and I was about to go down. I mean, nothing I've ever seen in my entire life has caused a reaction like that. And they were doing this 3,000 times a year, mm. you know. Yeah, you just you're left wondering if the inmates are running the asylum. I mean, <laughs> well, I I don't know. I mean, you know, and then they start with the uh, antipsychotic drugs. Uh, I mean, you know, basically what those things are just major tranquilizers, and and they make the you know, they change the person's personality, right. and and they're just like mind numbing. You know, they just you know. They're 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 awful. I mean, they're awful. Now but the they one, had. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh. You well, said the one. Yeah, the one. I mean, the one thing that they're not doing, which was the big difference that you did, was step back, and start to actually listen, to what these schizophrenic patients were saying. Oh no, that was that was forbidden. 
you know, I got in trouble for that. I don't know how many times, you know, because I was listening to what they had to say about the voices. And I got pulled up like in different units two or three times in front of the psychiatrist and ordered, directly ordered, not to ask psychotic patients about their voices or what the voices were telling them because I was reinforcing their hallucinations and making them worse, you know. But you know, here, here, here I'm being ordered to ignore their voices. What, what the, but if the psychiatrist found out the voices were telling them to kill themselves or to kill somebody else, the psychiatrist acted like somebody stuck a hot stick on their butt. They'd jump up, they'd lock these guys up, they'd fill them full of drugs, and, and they would just, you know, turn them into a zombie. So ignore the voices unless they're telling the patient to kill somebody or somebody else. And in that case, they're real. But otherwise, they're hallucinations. And, right. you know, you know, it's like, oh, my God, you know. Well, we've so, got a story like John Nash that was made into the film A Beautiful Mind. Just to kind of give us an, an understanding of what this is like. You know, the, the story of John Nash at least is famous. And you've got this guy who thinks he has a bunch of friends. He has a group of people that he talks to daily and then suddenly finds out that they're all in his head. I mean, this is amazing and disturbing. Well, the, the, most of what I took an interest in was, you know, there, there are many different forms of schizophrenia, you know, and, you know, one of the most prominent is paranoid schizophrenia. And that's where the patient hears these voices, you know, and they range all the way from the kind of stuff we hear, like, oh, you're screw up, uh, you know, you're worthless, all the way up to just horrifying, I mean, just absolutely horrifying things, um, you know, it, it's, it's another world, and, and when psychiatry, so here, here are these guys hearing these voices, they, you know, about a third of them feel they are real and they are demons. Okay. And and I've asked them because after questioning virtually all the staff I had access to at, at the state hospital as to what they thought these voices were and how they operated, uh, all of them said, well, they're hallucinations. Uh, they're due to a chemical brain imbalance in the brain. Um, I, I wasn't getting anywhere. They were all of the same opinion. They were all like they were all programmed in the same way in the same place and they had no interest in what these voices were telling these people unless they're telling them to kill themselves and they really and, were you know academic bias and you're in that classroom you don't get to have any examples or see or do any experimentation you've just got this basically a priestcraft in front of you telling you what is and what isn't and i mean i know you jerry you would throw a question at these people and, and it disturbed their entire world, I'm sure, while you were still in the university. Oh, man, I got in trouble so many times for that and nowhere in as much trouble as I did in the Ph.D. program. You know, one, one of the things, you know, I, I was raised not to trust authority, period. I mean, from the time I was a small kid. You know, so here, here you go. I, uh, yeah, I did. Uh, I got my undergraduate psych degree at Temple University, and here I'm sitting there, and just like you say, they're presenting you all this information, you know, and they're telling you that this is the truth, and that you must believe it. But the only place you could have, uh, the only section of psychology where you could verify that was experimental psychology, where you could go into a rat lab and you could see these different behavioral scenarios that come about when under certain conditions but all the rest clinical psych and and all so all these other psych areas there was no you, you had no way to check this out you had to take their word for it and i didn't like that you know and it, there were several several instances where i went this just doesn't make sense and and that was before i knew anything really and there were two in particular that stuck in mind is one we were giving this reading assignment and have normal psych and here's a psychologist writing you know if two psychotic guys with the same delusion were to meet each other you know and, and one of them would have to give up their delusion and and take another one 
And I'm like, why would that have to happen? You got two crazy guys. They're both crazy. Why would one of them have to give up their delusion and, and, and pick up another delusion because somebody else is in their area with the same delusion? You know, but, but I had, you know, n no undergraduate psych had access to any kind of clinical population. But that struck me as so bizarre, I logged it back in my head. And, uh, you know, several years later when I was working at uh, Central State Hospital, uh, I was doing my rounds and, and uh, on the second floor of one of the psychiatric units, uh, I saw a new patient. And he was walking around talking to himself, and uh, you know I, I hadn't seen him before, so I went to size him up and see what I had on my hands. And I said, uh, "Hey, guy, uh, what's your name?" And uh, you know I could hear him talking to himself before I got there, so I knew he was hearing voices. And uh, he said, "I'm Jesus Christ." And I went, "You are?" I said, "Wait a minute, no, you can't be Jesus Christ because I am." And I'm like, "Okay, what's he going to do?" So I'm standing there and they're watching, you know, and he looked perplexed. And then he looks up and he goes, okay, we can both be Jesus Christ. And he walks off. <laughs> Completely flew in the face of what this uh, clinical psychologist was writing. And I'm like, well, okay, if that's bull crap, what other bull crap are they, uh, are they up to here? And uh, there was another one came up. Now, one of the things they taught us. Uh, about schizophrenics in both graduate and undergraduate school is that they're so disorganized that they can't plan um, detailed, you know, they can't make detailed plans and carry them out. You know, they're just too disorganized, they're too messed up. So, uh, you know, one day I was over uh, Ed's psych, and I had friends that worked at, uh, that I graduated with that worked at different psych units. And uh, I was over Ed's unit one day, and I saw this. I mean, Central State didn't have the highest quality psychiatrist around. I mean, they were kind of like the bottom of the bucket. And there was this one guy over in Ed's unit who dressed like Sigmund Freud, you know, had, had a beard and mustache like Sigmund Freud, acted like Sigmund Freud, smoked a pipe like Sigmund Freud. He was one of the psychiatrists over there. And uh, Ed showed me. He goes, yeah, look at this guy. You know, I said, man, that's bizarre. So uh, one day Ed, uh, Ed calls me up and he goes, uh, you know, you got to come over here real quick. You got to see this. So uh, I ran over his unit and uh, he took me into this, this guy's uh, Sigmund Freud's office and I couldn't believe what I saw. Um, one of his patients, a, a, a schizophrenic, a psychotic guy who, you know, hated this guy. Completely psychotic. He was up on the third floor. He had made it at like three in the morning. Somehow he made it past three attendant stations onto the first floor where this guy's office was. He broke into his office. He got up on his desk in the middle of his desk and he took a crap and he shaped it into a pipe like this guy smoked. And then he escaped from the hospital and they never caught him. Uh. Now you talk about planning. I mean, you know, how did this guy get past three attendance stations and break into this guy's office and then somehow get out of the hospital without being caught? And he's psychotic as a bed bug. But yeah. well, what you discovered was that these voices were actually helping in these petty crimes, that these voices may have an agenda. Oh, they definitely got an agenda. Um, yeah, we're, we're well off my... Uh, my my thing here, uh, Am I but yeah, you off the outline. Let's but, yeah, to, we're, we're, let's, we're, let's <laughs> take it step by step because I want the audience to understand this situation. You know, so here we have you going through the entire university system, not being able to question anything. You've been led to believe things that you proved to be false. Now you've gotten yourself into uh, a state hospital where you still can explore but not so much and uh you you know you're going to start moving yourself into a position where you get to explore this a little bit more so yeah please uh keep us on track here okay yeah one more thing to add to the uh, uh educational thing you know one of the things i wanted to know the most is where thoughts came from you know and what they were because if you know how can you understand the mind if you don't understand that and, you know, and like 
eight years of psychology and four of graduate school, that was never mentioned. So while I was in the PhD program, supposedly one of the best in the world, which I was really, I mean, in the country, which I was really disillusioned with, I, I actually asked the head of, you know, the department one day in a lecture. He said, anybody have any questions? I rose my hand. And I said, uh, yeah, where do thoughts come from? And he just looked at me like I was a Martian that had fallen out of a spaceship, you know, and it was like I had red flagged myself, you know. That's a simple <laughs> question, but so important. I mean, you don't ask a professor in front of a big group to answer something he has no answer for. So I had really red flagged myself there. Yeah. But that is a, it's a critical importance. I mean, we have a heart that pulses at a beat that we don't know why. Uh, you know, we have these thoughts that come in our heads that are mostly negative. You know, when you start to analyze the 50,000 thoughts that go through your head, I would say over half of them, if not more, are negative. Well, the, the ones where these entities are, are most noticeable are the ones where you you know you're just walking down the street and all of a sudden this horrible horrible thought barges into your mind i mean something that's so horrible you you're shocked you even thought it you know you know it's not you you know it didn't come from you you know you would never act on something like that and it just gives you the shivers to even think a thought like that and you, you kind of go where, where the devil did that come from you know that's them these things are being inserted into your mind. So, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure what these voices were for a long time. Nobody on the staff knew what they were. They were all hallucinations. They're to be ignored. You don't listen to them. You don't give them any atten uh, attention. You know, nothing like that. So, um, you know, when I first got to the, uh, I mean, the Central State Hospital was so big, it was like a small city. I mean, there, there. You walk down the street at night, and here's these huge buildings with the windows open in the summer, and you hear these shrieks coming out of these buildings, these ungodly shrieks that were eerie, you know. And it was like, uh, wow, you know, you you could feel that something was, you know, something was there that just wasn't right. But in the daytime, I was fascinated because, I mean. You know, I was fascinated by abnormal psychology, and, and in this place, there was every everything that could go wrong with the human mind was somewhere in this place. So, when, after the first couple of years of getting to that place, I, you know, I noticed a, a handful of oddities that, you know, I, I just couldn't explain and I didn't understand. Is One was that, you know, the psychotic patients were acting in very bizarre ways. And they were self-destructive, and and it was consistent. And I mean, they, it was they weren't doing anything good. It was all bad. And one of the first things I encountered like that that was fairly bizarre was, uh, as, as you know, as a new staff members, one of the uh, psychotic patients had cut off his penis with a razor blade, and they had sewed it back on, and it was the talk of the hospital cafeteria whether it was taking or not. You know? Now, this happened on EDGE unit, and I'm thinking, like, why did he do that? Nobody asked him that. So I asked Ed. I said, Ed, look this guy up and ask him why he did that. <laughs> Ed came back to last, uh, the next day. I said, you, you, you know, we met at lunch. I said, you ask him? He goes, yeah, I asked him. Said, well, what did he say? He said, I don't need it anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, it's like huh. weird. <laughs> you know, the other thing that was really strange that was really evident that I saw happening throughout the hospital and I couldn't explain why at the time I know now but at the time it was a perplexing you know psychiatrists who had caseloads of three and four hundred patients spending only 15 or 20 minutes a month with psychotic patients were being attacked at a rate three to five times higher than all other medical staff or regular doctors and it was an attack rate that was as high as attendants who spent eight hours a day with them all day long. You know, so there was something going on there where psychotic patients did not like 
psychiatrist. You know, and it, 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 it was only psychiatrists. It wasn't psychiatric nurses. It wasn't psychology people like me. It wasn't attendants. It was, it was just psychiatrists. It made no sense to me at all. Why were they being attacked at such a rate? You know, which probably made them more gun-shy about provoking these people. You know, because right. they were the ones being attacked. Yeah. Uh, now the, the other thing that made no sense is that these these uh, high-powered tranquilizers were the only thing that they had that would suppress these psychotic voices and and kind of even partly bring these guys back to reality. And the patients would consistently stop taking their meds as if they wanted to return back to a psychotic state. Now. You know, that made no sense to me. And it, it was akin to, I mean, the side effects of these meds are awful. You know, but the effect of going floridly the psychotic is, I, I mean, what would be equivalent is you give them a choice. You know, hey, what would you rather have, the flu or would you rather have the bubonic plague? And they would consistently choose the bubonic plague. Yeah. I had no idea why, but it was across the entire hospital. It was happening over and over again, and they'd just be put on their meds, and it was just a big merry-go-round going round and round. They'd be drugged up, they'd go off their meds, they'd put them back on their meds again. Um, you know, it just went over and over and over again. Yeah. So they weren't curing anything. These meds cured nothing. All they did was kept these guys, uh, you know, sedated and out of out of trouble. You know. So throughout the hospital, everybody believed that. Okay, these voices are caused by a chemical imbalance. But, you know, I'm looking around and I go, okay, you you know, if that's true, why aren't psychiatrists ever taking any kind of labs or measurement or any kind of test to see what's out of balance before they start filling these guys with all these different drugs? It never happened. I'm watching this and questioning, like, okay, if it's a chemical imbalance, it would seem to treat it. They'd have to know what was out of balance. Yeah. You know? And no. I've got to say, Jerry, that a lot of the people that I know, I've known a few psychotics and a few people that just, uh, you know, weren't right. And when they were told that they had a chemical imbalance, it gave them an excuse. And suddenly it was like, well, you know, I have an imbalance, so this is how I am. Well, <sighs> You know, the, these guys, when they start hearing voices, they struggle with what's going on. You know, it's like, you know, they're never told that voices or your thoughts might not be your own. You know, it's it's just everybody's programmed to be thinking, that, okay, if it appears in your mind, it's your thought. You know, it belongs to you. You somehow generated it, you know. But with right. these these awful messages that are coming through with these to these guys, I mean, and they're horrible, yeah. horrible. I mean, I could go into the details, but you know, they they start off as just bad, and then they move up into nightmarish states, and they're struggling with, you know, can th- could this be me? You know, wh- what what is going on here? And and what I was seeing, you know, after I ran out, I didn't get any answers from from staff. I would ask the the patients themselves. What do you think these things are? You know, about a third of them would say, without a doubt, unequivocally, they're demons. You know, and then they'd look at me like, okay, you know, you're not going to believe me like n- none of the other staff believe me. You know, and well, I, I didn't know they acted like demons, they, <clears throat> but I didn't quite believe in demons. Another third would say, well, I, I, I don't know what they are. They're not good, but I don't know what they are. You know, I'm not sure they belong to me. I'm not sure they don't. You know, <clears throat> so they're kind of on the edge. Now, the last third were the ones that fell into the believing the psychiatrist. Your brain is broken. It'll be broken forever. There's nothing we know how to do to fix it. You're going to have to take these mind-numbing meds for the rest of your life. The what you're hearing are hallucinations. They're not real. You know, and there's nothing you can do about it. That is such a awful, debilitating, helpless message. You know, it's like all you can do is take these awful drugs. That's all there is. There's no cure. You know, where if the guys who believe they're demons, I mean, that's something different from who they are. 
now they have an, an enemy that is not themselves. You know, it's something that's attacking them. They don't know what it is. They don't know how it works. It's in there, but they see it as different from themselves. You know, it is not who they are. So the, here's a struggle between these voices that are trying to grab more and more control and power, and the, and the person who's in there kind of trying to fight him off and not knowing how. But when they're told, you know, you're, you're broken, you know, the psychiatry's telling them, yeah, those voices are you. Your mind is broken. There's nothing you can do about it. There is no enemy you can fight. All you can do is take these toxic drugs. That's all you can do. Now, those drugs cure nothing. They rot out their peripheral nervous systems, eventually causing something called extrapyramidal syndrome, which is this uncontrollable shaking that, that you know, if it keeps going, it it's becomes permanent. So you see these... these uh, uh, patients walking all through the hospitals that are just quivering and shaking and they call it the Thorazine shuffle they're burned out from taking years and years of these antipsychotic medications and and now they're they came you know they can barely walk but of course psychiatry has something for that too you know oh cogentin we'll just give them some cogentin and that'll mask those symptoms also we'll give them the antipsychotics to mask the psychotic symptoms they don't go anywhere they just mask them and then when the physical symptoms start going, oh, we'll give them something else to mask that. All the while, these, these destructive processes are going on under, underneath the medications. Meanwhile, you're discovering that there might be some supernatural power to these voices as they seem to be prescient, prescient uh, seem to be able to give knowledge to the, uh, the psychotic without, you know... Well, I would love it if you'd share some of the stories of what these voices are telling these people to do. Oh, boy. Uh, yeah, I could give you a, a brief rundown of that. Um, you, you know, at the, they, like I said, they, they kind of start off, you know, and what they want you to do is believe that what you're hearing is you. And I've had several patients who would just, you know, out and out ask them, who are you? You know, what are you? And the voices would respond back, we're you. You know, that's what they want. You know? So then they, you know, it's <clears throat> one of the things I, I first noticed when I started asking patients at the hospital about their voices. Um, and now this was very difficult because there is no positive outcome for these patients to talk about those voices, you know, right. they, they, you know, they've been locked up, they've been drugged, their families have brought them to psychiatrists, their friends have abandoned them. There is no positive outcome to speak about these voices. And, and later, years later, I found out the voices themselves were demanding that they not speak about them. And I don't know how many times where I was questioning a patient while I was working in the uh, in the prison where the voices would come out and tell the patient, you know, don't tell him anymore. He already knows too much. Shut up. And they would report that to me. And that happened over and over and over again. <clears throat> but <clears throat> one thing I saw is that these voices were consistently, unswervingly, negative, destructive, derogatory, insulting. They would, they would start off with telling the patient, you're no good. You're worthless. Nobody cares about you. Uh, your your friends are faking like they like you. Your family is faking like they like you. You're worthless. You never can get anything done. You know, on, on Sherry's website, we have the three or four pages of what these things say. Uh, and then it moves up into darker areas where, you know, attack this person. Uh, or this guy's trying to kill you, so you need to kill him first. And... Uh, you know, these, these people can become supernaturally strong. And in the prison, the gangsters would take the antipsychotic medications away from these, these psychotic guys. And then they would say, hey, that guy over in the other gang, is uh, he's going to kill you. You better get him first. You know, and they, these guys were like psychotic torpedoes. And they go attack these guys and, you know, then they, they get locked up and full of drugs again. I mean, so the prisons today have become the state hospitals. So when the state hospitals... Uh, emptied out. They said, oh, yeah, we're going to put a uh, mental health uh, system in place. Yeah, they did, and then they defunded it. 
So now the mental health system in the U.S. is in shambles. It's a mess. All these guys are going to prison. You know, so here you have all these psychotic guys in prison. Half of them don't get medications. They're being whipped up into a frenzy. And after five or ten years, they're more psychotic than they ever were. And then they release them onto the streets with two weeks' worth of medicine and say, hey, if the voices come back, go back to, to the nearest emergency room. <laughs> you know, so psychotic, right. is, it's, oh, it's, it's, it's sickening what's going on. And I've but, seen that. I saw a mass exodus, and they're all on the city buses. And Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, you have no idea. Yeah. So, yeah, they're telling them all kinds of horrible things. Um, but <clears throat> after after I'd, I, it, it took like two or three years to break through how to get these people to trust me where they will talk about their their voices. And what I did, th how, how that happened was by bit by bit as I learned something new that other people, staff didn't know about the voices you know i would start off with uh hey you're hearing voices uh, something like that and they go yeah i'm hearing them yeah they're a bunch of assholes aren't they and the guy would look up like you know that statement alone covered a lot of ground you know it's like yeah they weren't good you know they aren't they aren't good you know they're assholes you know you're not denying and saying they're hallucinations you know uh so you know that would get their attention and then, uh, you know, you add other stuff like, uh, you know, they get you about two or three in the morning a lot of times, don't they? You know, they're like, yeah, how'd you know that? You know? And, and yeah, that it, is just, amazing right there. Just the ability to apply what one schizophrenic is saying to the, uh, the life of the experience of another one. I mean, this is already showing some cohesiveness from these voices. Well, you know what was what was you know, it kind of blew me away is after seven years at the state hospital and, and studying as much as I could. I mean, and in those seven years, I, I, I learned relatively little compared to what I learned at, at the state prison. Because at the state hospital, the underlying rule was you don't upset psychotic inmate, inmates. You don't, you, you don't, you do, you don't upset them, you know, and what I found is when I started questioning them about their voices, they would become upset. I didn't know why, but they didn't like to be asked about their their voices. So, you know, I'd been in trouble there several times for asking questions about the voices they were hearing, and I was having to walk on eggshells, you know. So I would only glean, you know, a, a thing or two at a time, but then the next one, next psychotic I worked with, I go, well, okay, uh, you know, I, I know I know this about them. They're, you know, they're awful. They, you know, they they hit you at, at night. They never say anything good. Uh, you know, and you just keep adding bit by bit, and and then they see you're trying to understand what's happening to them, and and they will begin talking to you and opening up a little more. You know, and the more I knew, the more they opened up, and the quicker. You know, but in the early days, in those first seven years, I, I, I didn't know a, a whole lot. You know, so it was very slow going. Um, but uh, you know, by the time I got to the uh, when I got to the state prison, everything you know, everything was different. So the bottom underlying rule in the state hospital was you you don't upset psychotic patients no matter what. You don't do anything to upset them. You know, we're understaffed. They're attacking psychiatry at a, a horrendous rate. Uh, if you upset them, the psychiatrist's going to have to deal with them, and psychiatrists are being beat up by these guys. You know, we don't know why. Uh, so don't upset them. Don't do anything. Now, in the prison, it's a different story. I mean, uh, you know, the whole the whole underlying thing there is well. You know, inmates are liars. You can't trust any of them. They're all a bunch of whiners. Uh, they're, you know, uh, you know, they, <coughs> the upsetting an inmate <laughs> by asking them. Up, well, yeah, they're criminals. They're, they're, they're less than human. I mean, and that's kind of what they teach them in the, um, uh, you know, in the, in the entrance. When, the, when the, you first get on, they give you this, uh, you know, introductory kind of thing. Um, and, and, you know, they are not uh, act like a human, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah the, you know, these guys aren't human. So, you know, uh, so the kind of stuff, 
you know, where, where a patient at the state hospital would get upset over, you know, being questions about the voices, you know. It's here, going noticed. Yeah. yeah, here in the state prison, I mean, you could have the, the voices go off and start screaming at you and, da, 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 and cursing you and that kind of stuff. And, and that doesn't even break the, you know, the ambient noise level. I mean, that, that, that doesn't, right. you know, that doesn't even come close to, you know, and then, you know. Now you've got kind of an open laboratory. Oh, you boy. You can actually delve got, into all these mysteries that you've uh, been... Unre- unrestricted, yeah. you know, but but I still know what what psychiatry uh, would do if they caught me doing that, you know. Um, yeah, just like so, YouTube. Yeah. Okay, they're going to delete you. They're going to delete me. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the, the more, what I did when I got there is surrounded myself with inmates who were willing who wanted to get rid of the voices and were willing to tell me real time everything that they were telling them, you know, and turn that over to me. Now, that was rare, you know, very few, especially in the prison. I mean, you know, you, you could see why. I mean, if here, here, if you're an inmate and you're telling the psych that the voices are telling you to kill somebody, you know, that's a very unnerving situation when that psych could have you locked down and, and you, you wouldn't see the light of day and, and drugged up, drugged senseless, you know, for months. You know, that, you could see where they wouldn't trust you. So, you know, I, I, I formulated a relationship with these guys and, and gave them, you know, kind of, hey, I know this about the voices. I'm not sure they're hallucinations. I don't know what they are. I'm trying to find out. I want your help. Now, I'll make a deal with you. You know, you can tell me anything, and I will not sick the guards on you or the psychiatrist unless you act on it. You know, if I feel that you're about to act on it, you're about to hurt yourself or somebody else, you know, and you can't convince me otherwise, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to take action. But otherwise, you can tell me whatever you want, whatever these things are telling you, and you know, I'll do what I can to help you out, and I won't turn you into the authorities. So, you know, <clears throat> they started testing me out, and they saw in a lot of cases that, you know, where a normal average psych would turn them in and have them drugged, I would not, you know, but I'd keep a close eye on them. And I'd, I'd also could adjust my schedule of seeing them. And, and with this group, there was a group of about 10 of them that would do this. And the rest I, you know... They were very suspicious, but the and I always had a group of about ten or fifteen um, that would tell me what what these things were saying, and uh, you know you, you could see where they they wouldn't want to talk about it because you know these things are telling them horrible, uh, embarrassing things to do. Um, yeah. now, the ones that shocked me were the ones that were telling stories that were telling these people what to do. As if they had omniscient powers. Well, you know, I think some of them did. Now, uh, you know, that came kind of later on. Uh, you know, when I was working, there was there was one guy who actually he recovered. I mean, uh, he he came inside. I was working with him six months or you know maybe three quarters of a year. And what we would do is I. <clears throat> I saw that these voices were telling them to do all these horrible things that would get them in trouble, you know, and, uh, you know, they would call them names and, and tell them lies. And so as they told me what these voices were telling them, I would debunk the voices, you know, and, and say, well, you know, that's a lie. You're not like that. <clears throat> you know, if you, you attack this guy, you're going to get locked down, you know, don't be messing with these drug guys. So what I would do is, is kind of, short circuit what the voices were telling them and I would make my office available to them where if they felt like they were losing control I would get them in as soon as possible and work with them and you know you know give them homework assignments and kind of try to turn them more onto a positive spiritual path by giving them not necessarily religious material but spiritual positive material what's shocking here Jerry is that you're the only person doing this 
Well, I found out later there was one exorcist <clears throat> on the unit, uh, but I didn't know that for years. Um, but yeah, that, I was the only one doing it because I everybody mean, else you know, believed they were down, hallucinating. Actually listening, actually getting the stories. You know, it's it's amazing to me that it's taken this long to have a fascinated mind like yours come in and start to actually dig in. It's uh, I, I can't believe it's not the norm and that you had to do this all in secret. It's just astounding. Oh, yeah, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't let this out. I could not let this out. So, you know, <clears throat> what, what started happening is, is these men I was working with were getting better. You know, the, the more we could debunk the voices, the more we could reduce their power, the more we could, you know, say they're liars or, and, and, and just kind of interfere with what they were doing, you know, the better these guys were getting. You know, they had more energy. Um, they were able to work in their classes better. Um, you know, the voices came less and they were stronger. And then a, a strange thing started happening all at about the same time. They were coming into me one by one at different times and saying, the voices are really getting pissed off with you. And I'm like, what? Yeah, they're really getting pissed off with you. They're, they're telling me to, you know, attack you. They're telling me not to come in for, for meetings. Uh, they're telling me you're full of crap, not to listen to anything you have to say. You're crazy. You know, leave the office. Don't come back here. Um, you know, go tell somebody about what you're doing. I mean, they're telling me, oh, you know, and, and before I, I, when I get up in the morning, I know I have an appointment with you. They said, do not go. Do not go. They give me headaches. You know, and, and here are all of them are reporting the same kind of thing. So here's, you know, 10 different inmates, a lot of, a lot of whom don't even know each other, all reporting the same thing, you know, in response to doing things that are weakening the voices and short-circuiting them. And I'm like, this is weird, you know, it, it, it's getting personal. And, and I'm like, and I'm still, you know, even though a third of them are, are telling me these things are demons, you know, I'm still not quite buying that. You know, what I, what I saw was that uh, virtually all these guys, all these schizophrenic people were badly physically, sexually, emotionally abused or went through some kind of horrible trauma that, that warped their psyche and, and turned it negative and fearful. You know, and, and, and it wasn't, a lot of times it just didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, they had this horrible background. Um, and I was thinking, well, it, it, you know, something within their subconscious changed and, and that their subconscious was now uh, dangerously bruised. And, and, you know, since they were programmed this way, the subconscious is kind of telling them to keep doing the same things and stay in trouble because that's who they were. They were somebody who was in trouble and always going to be in trouble and they were worthless. And, you know, so I was thinking, you know, that, but the, the more... The more of these guys who came and spoke to me, <laughs> the thinner that theory got, and and it it was it was in shambles. But I still was not willing to let go of it. You know? And then one guy that <clears throat> I was working with extensively, who was doing real well, as as he left the office <clears throat> one day, he turned around in the office and he looked at me and he goes, uh, "You know what you're doing is dangerous, don't you?" And I just kind of looked at him like I, I hadn't thought about. It. You know, I was thinking, well, whatever these things are, they're stuck in the head of these patients and they can't come out, you know, and I'd never been hit by them. I mean, they, they've told them to attack me. They've told them to, you know, tear my office up. They, I mean, they told them to do all kinds of awful stuff, but it was always the voices trying to get them to behave in a way that would harm me, you know? but I never saw one come out or, or do anything or anything fly around the office or anything like that. So when he said that, I was like, "Whoa!" Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> that you know, it, it kind of took me off guard, but it, it didn't stop me. You know, well, like so the danger was it that these entities might leave them and come to you, or I, I, was I, it just the threat of of getting you know, them riled up in a closed office? Well, I, I didn't know. You know, I was I was so taken back by, you know, the guy was about to walk out of my office, you know, he's heading out. And then like, a, like as an afterthought, he turns around, looks me straight in the eye 
you know, after we'd spent an hour working together to, you know, kind of short circuit these things, he looks at me right in the eye and he goes, uh, you know what you're doing is dangerous, don't you? And I just kind of looked at him and I was so kind of taken off guard, I, I didn't even have a response. You know, and then he turns around and he walks out. And I'm like, whoa, and you know, where'd, that, where'd that come from? So, you know, I just kept going, you know, <clears throat> working with these guys. And, and the same thing was happening when they were getting better, you know. And then one day, the same guy comes back, you know. He wasn't scheduled for appointment. He knocks on my office door, and I look at him like, hey, man, what's going on? He goes, i, I got to talk to you. So he walks in, and I say, sit down. He goes, uh, the voices want to, they want to speak to you. I'm like, they want to speak to me personally? And he goes, yeah, they want to talk to you directly. That had never, it had never happened before. <clears throat> in like, you know, whatever it was, 15, 20 years, that had never happened before. It was always the voices would call me names and, and say things for the, you know, the patient to tell me. And then I would tell the patient, well, tell them to go to hell. They're a bunch of creeps or I didn't know what they were. Just, you know, get out of my face. And, you know, they would, the, the patient would always be the interpreter. You know, they were always the go-between. I never had a direct conversation with these things. So, you know, I'm like looking at this guy. And I'm like, what? They want to talk to me directly. He goes, yeah. And, I, and I'm kind of like taken aback. And I go, well, what, what do they have to say? And uh, he looks straight at me. His voice changes a little. It gets a little deeper. And these words came out of his mouth. They're still burned in my memory. He, he said, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. And I'm like, whoa. Our way of life? Plural? You know, that wasn't the inmate speaking. You know, and as soon as he said those words, he turned to me. He said, "That that wasn't me. That was them." You know, I didn't say that. They said that. You know, and my denial system just completely shattered. You know, there was no doubt in my mind at that point that these things were entities, that they were not hallucinations at all. They were not subconscious anything. They were not part of the guy's mind. These were separate, destructive, nasty entities. <clears throat> you know, and you know, I could no longer deny that. I could, I could no longer, you know, th and this was a whole different ballpark now. You know? I can't wait. We're gonna, we're gonna dig into that in the second hour. We're gonna look into this most deeply. But I want to give you the opportunity now that we're in the public hour to really leave a message for those in the industry you know, lay out for those that are in this industry that probably will never hear the show, uh, but maybe it'll get around to them in some way, shape, or form. You know, the message that you're trying to get to the industry, to, to the psychologist, and because we've only got a short amount of time left in this first hour, I want to make sure that you get the message out to the right people as to... Why you're here, Jerry, you know, why you're here on this show right now trying to get this word out to people. Okay, let, <clears throat> let me see if I can't summarize it very quickly. You know, a big part of it was what you said. Listen to these people. You know, listen to what the voices are telling them. Don't blow this off as a hallucination. What you will see is that there is a consistent, negative, destructive, nasty, ugly message that these voices are giving these people. You know, they're not random. They're not clinical hallucinations. Clinical hallucinations are all over the place. They're random. They, they make no sense. They, they, they don't follow any pattern. These things follow a very predictable pattern. You know, matter of fact, I, I, I can almost tell you what they're going to say under certain conditions. You know, they are always consistently negative. The question has to be asked is what holds them on that track? They're like a locomotive moving down a single track, and they don't divert from that. What holds them on that track? You know, this, the, the next thing they will see is that after these voices attack, these people are drained. They have no energy. You know, and they will tell you this. After the voices hit me, 
I, I, I have no energy. I can't even get out of bed. Now, they have no idea where their energy went. You know? And for years, I thought it was because of the anxiety and the paranoia and the fear that these things cause that drain the energy. Then one day when I was working in, in, in the jail for the prison, one of the most dangerous units, you know, I spoke to a florid psychotic and somebody the uh, gangsters were doing everything they could to kill. I mean, they'd already stabbed this guy. They're, they're, nobody could be under as much stress as this guy the gangsters were trying to kill. They'd even moved gangsters into the, into the unit there to try to get him. And, you know, I watched them one after another. I interviewed them went back to back. And I watched him walk up the steps, and the guy the gangsters were trying to kill had ten times more energy. He looked like Superman compared to the psychotic guy, you know, uh, who, who was drained. You know? And you know, I went, no, that that my theory is wrong. There, there, something else is taking their energy. Right? So with the same guy that uh, uh, warned me about, um, you know, how dangerous these things were. Uh, I, I was led to, right before that, I was led to start reading some books by uh, several different shamans. It was like an intuitive thing where I saw these books and I just picked them up and started reading. They started talking about these entities uh, that match these voices. And they said, these things are draining their energy. Now, I noticed that after the voices attacked, these guys had no energy. They couldn't even get out of bed. They were drained. But I, 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 I had no idea where it came from. So I brought one of these books in by the shaman, and I brought this one guy in who I'd been working with for almost a year, and I said, listen, this shaman is, is saying something that seems to make sense, but I'd like your opinion. You know, I'd like to know what you have to say about what he's saying. And he goes, well, okay. So I closed the door and started reading. And as soon as it's the shaman started talking about how these things were energy parasites stealing the patient's energy. This guy went into a trance and he was just sitting there staring at me. You know, it was like he, he froze and here was this eerie look and, and I was like, whoa, what's going on? You know, as soon as I hit the part where they were energy parasites, then all of a sudden this crackling, this electrical crackling started behind my head. You know, and it sounded like an arc well. It was loud. And it started moving up the wall behind me, up to the ceiling, and then across the ceiling toward the front of the office. And here I am searching for what's causing this. I could see nothing. I could smell nothing. And I, I was afraid to take my eyes off this guy because I thought he was going to attack me. You know? And, and I, I'm glancing between him and where this noise is, and I asked him, I said, do you hear that? And he's just staring at me. You know, he's not saying anything. He's not moving. Right, he's it's just a doctor, right? No, no, no. This is oh, another this is patient. patient. Okay. Yeah. I wanted his opinion. I see. You know, and I, just, I knew he was still hearing voices, but they were greatly weakened. So, and, and I had no idea what kind of reaction yeah, you're hearing. So, yeah, now I'm hearing things. And here's this, this crackling that goes all the way to the front of the office and, and I'm watching and I'm glancing between him and the thing. Because I, I pushed my chair back against the wall. I was afraid he was going to attack me. And the guard up front in the medical unit was a female. She would be useless. So this, this crackling starts moving across the ceiling over his head to the left side of the room. And I'm still watching. I, I could see nothing, but it was loud. It was very loud. And he's still staring at me. And then it starts coming down the wall on my left side. And, and I'm, you know, like... You know, is he going to attack me? What's going on here? And I'm like freaked out. And then it, it leaps into this Rubbermaid trash can right next to my left leg. And I look down there, and it had been cleaned by the inmate uh, porter the, the night before. There's nothing in there. It's empty except for this loud crackling sound. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, and, and I'm staring at him. And then the crackling stops, and he slowly gets up, you know, like very stiffly and and he you know he kind of goes I need to go and I'm like yeah, get the hell out of here go go you know and, wow. and, he, and he walks down the hall and I'm I'm sitting there absolutely stunned I'm like did I just ex 
experience that, you know. And I get up after he leaves. I'm going to have to make sure he was out of the building. And I, I look at all the other offices all the way down the hall. They're all locked. There's nobody there. There's, there's nothing there that could have accounted for an electrical crackling that was as loud as an arc welder. And, and I'm just absolutely shocked. I mean, I, I didn't know what to make of that at, at all. I, I, you know, I knew it was somehow connected to my question and him, but I, I wasn't sure what was going on. And I was scared shitless. I mean, I was like, phew. I, I, I closed my office. I didn't see anybody the rest of the day, and I just kind of sat there stunned. You know? And I was, I was so afraid. I did not call this inmate back for two to three months. You know, I, I, I didn't want to see him. <laughs> I didn't want to be locked in the same office with him. And, uh, you know, he, he was doing fairly well at the time I saw him, you know, the last time. After about three months, I, my curiosity got the best of me. And I sent out a pass for the guards to bring him down, you know, put him in the office, sat him down. And, you know, we did a little bit of small talk. I was surprised he was in as good a shape as he was. I was expecting, okay, if the voices could do that, they've torn him the ribbons. He's, he's going to be a basket case. He wasn't, you know, he, he was still in a pretty good shape. He said, I'm still working to minimize the effect the voices have on me, you know. And then I just, uh, after the small talk, I said, did you hear that crackling the last time uh, you were in my office? And he goes, well, yeah, I did, but I'm surprised that you did. And I said, what the hell was that? And he goes, that was them. Uh, you mean the voices? And he goes, yeah, that was the voices. You know, and and that, that was another shock, because I didn't think they could come out of the head of whoever they were testing and affect other aspects of physical reality. So here's a whole different dimension, you know, like if they can do this, what else can they do? You know, so yeah. I'm, I'm like sitting there like, you know, and, and, you know. We're well, going to have to dig deeper uh, into yeah. this. I, well, I want to know more. Yeah, let, let, we're running out of time in the first hour here. I'm sure we're uh, even over. Um, Give me 30, 30 more seconds to finish this. Oh, uh, my apologies. Okay, please, okay. please do. So, yes. so uh, he said, well, that was them. I said, what were they trying to do? He said, they were trying to scare you. And I said, they did a damn good job. And then I, said, I asked him, I said, what, what were they telling you as you left my office that day? He said, they were telling me to go get a shank and come back and stick it in your gut. And I'm like, uh, well, why didn't you do that? He turned around and he looked at me and he goes, I couldn't find one. Oh, man. What a job you have, Jerry. Like, Well, that's uh, not, that wasn't the job that most people in my position did. I mean, this, I had entered, I had entered a, a totally different world and it was, I didn't have any map. You know, right. I, I had no you know, there was no GPS. I didn't know what was out there. I didn't know where it was going. I had no cognitive map of what, how these things operated. Or and again, you couldn't come home talk to your wife oh, about the talk. guy about to shank you, or you can't talk to your peers and your your colleagues because nope. you're not supposed to be doing this. I mean, nope. what? Wow. You know, I had to keep it to myself, and I'm kind of wondering, you know, hey, am I getting psychotic? I mean, uh, am I going crazy? Right. Uh, I mean, I had to ask myself, and there was nobody to run this past. There was nobody right. to talk to. If I brought it up to my boss, I'd be fired or, or labeled a, a lunatic. You know, the only people who understood were the schizophrenics. You know, when I told them about the, oh, yeah, 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 oh, yeah, yeah, they do that to me. That, you know, it was like, yeah, okay, I could talk. But I couldn't talk to any, anybody normal in the human race. It, you know, it was very isolating. Well, it seems to me that all of us seem to have a bit of this psychic parasite in us, giving us these horrible messages and, and you know, diminishing our spirit. And it seems that those that suffer more trauma, deeper, deeper trauma than just the real world provides, you know, m molestation and abuse, then the voices seem to be able to come to the front. But I, from listening to you, I think that there would be a lot of people listening saying, you know what, I got those voices saying this stuff to me. 
Yeah, and and you know, it's it's not like psychiatry says. It, it's not like us and them. You know, they're crazy and we're not. We're all crazy to different degrees. I mean, this is a continuum. You know, it it it. it we're all humans, and this and the schizophrenics are at the you know, you know, top ten percent of the normal curve. But right. but these things attack us all. Now you know, you might say, oh no 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 they don't. But if you step back and you go, okay, I'm going to step back and I'm going to watch my thoughts come into my mind, you know, and th- then you can see them flow in. You're the watcher. You know you're the watcher. You are not the thought. You're watching that thought materialize in your mind. You know. Now, what these things want you to do is jump on it. And once you jump on it and believe it, then it injects its poison in you. And what they want to do is generate negative emotional energy. That's what they feed off of. That's why these voices are always negative and horrible and rotten. You know. So if you jump on that thought and you think it's yours... Then you make it yours. And then and you're feeding them. And you're feeding them. And you become what they are telling you you are. Which feeds them even more. Which feeds them even more. Astounding. Well, guys, I hope this opens a whole new paradigm for you folks. It really has for me. This, this concept of taking it from the clinical into the real world and understanding that there i mean we we have evidence of psychic parasites we have evidence of uh material parasites that can take over the mind of creatures and we have a world that is going into massive disruption right now Uh, and maybe each and every war maybe every time mankind turns on himself it is due to these voices. You know, I have no doubt because look at the amount of negative energy that is produced in a war. You know, yes. the the prison itself was a feeding ground for these things. I mean, yes. the, the paranoia, the fear, they want to generate as much fear and and upset. That's that's what they feed off of. You know, so if they can get a war going, all they got to do is, you know, kind of trigger it and then they sit by and they just feed, they just gorge. You know, and I think a lot of our our people, uh, you know, in the in the deep state, are just infested with these things. They, <laughs> I, would, they, I would they, think so. They think of nobody think. except themselves and their own gain. You know, and that's kind of what these things do. Also, they they don't they don't give a crap about you know the people that they're torturing and and destroying their lives. They could care less. Well, I open this story with Robert Smith Todd. Abe Lincoln's father-in-law being a psychotic psychologist, (laughs) binding people in torturous devices and rolling them around gleefully in this haunted asylum. Well, guys, Jerry Jerry gets far more into uh, things that go bump in the night, so this next hour is going to be very fascinating as we start to dig into some of the prescience that these voices seem to have. We'll try to see what what throws them into a frenzy. Uh, see if we can find the cures and the understandings on the other side. And then let's go ahead and bounce this into the concepts of synchronicity and have a look at how positive forces and positive voices could even be there as well. So um, I hope you all will come over to freemantv.com and subscribe. I hope you will all let everyone on YouTube know that I'm not on YouTube. I can't upload to YouTube. They have me blocked right now. I'm hoping to not get my third strike and and keep going on YouTube. But, of course, everything will keep going on FreemanTV.com. And follow me on Twitter at FreemanTV to get all the news stories and thoughts and theories that are going on. For Jerry Marzinski and his amazing tale... Mostly you follow Jerry on Facebook. Uh, Jerry, you also have a YouTube channel, correct? Yeah, I've got a YouTube channel, but um, <laughs> I, I wish I knew how to, how to use it better. I mean, I have several videos on, on the front, but the others are stuck under the video section. You know, and I don't know how to get them over onto the main page. I, I wish I, I wish I knew how to work that thing. but Maybe I could help you, Jerry. I, uh, I have been at this for 13 years. 
Oh, that would and be great. I have had to go through every hoop there is. This is the longest running talk show on YouTube, and it's oh. about to be deleted. Oh, that is that is a shame. But I I can help you with all that stuff. I will, and I'll get you in with Alonzo Pachardo. Maybe we can get you a website and get things going. Uh, just so everybody know, Alonzo doesn't work for free. <laughs> he wants to get paid for his his talents, and it's uh, it's worth it, honestly. But we can get you set up, Jerry. Uh, we'll get you going in this whole situation. Because yeah, I mean, you got to have demons in your head to be able to work in the World Wide Web. Oh man, you know, Sherry and I have been working on a book for years, and. Uh, it, you know, it's very slow going. We're, we're trying to get it through a writer's group at the university, and it's like they're just not satisfied with anything. So, you know, we've got uh, maybe six or seven chapters finished, but we're, we're working on it. Fantastic. Well, I hope you folks will go and check out Jerry's work. Give them any details they need to, to I mean, Facebook, you're, you're Jerry Marzinski on Facebook. And is uh -oh. that the best place for people to try and find your work? Well, you know, Facebook is, you know, we, it, it's not the best medium, no. <laughs> you know, uh, but yeah, we, we try to keep it uh, up to date there. Um, it's, the, the site is called The Presence of Other Worlds uh, in Schizophrenia, I think that's what we call it. Okay, yeah, well, I'll it's, get that all linked up for sure. Yeah, yeah The Presence of Other Worlds in Schizophrenia. You know, and we have a lot of people chiming in saying, yeah, I've experienced these things. This, this works. Uh, Sherry's program works. Um, you know, and, the, and they're talking to one another. Well, I've, got, I've got some stories about, you know, patients I worked with who kind of made friends with these things. Well, that's and, where I want to go with you next. So, it, folks, we're going to sign off here because uh, we're just chomping at the bit to get into these stories. I hope you all will come to FreemanTV.com, subscribe, and get the second hour. It's the only way to sponsor this independent media. As you can see, we're being shut down left and right and everywhere. And pretty soon it's just going to be the website. So, um, you know, they're corralling us, folks. I hope you'll come along. That's where I'll be, freemantv.com. We'll see you all next week.